My name's Rev Becker, I'm from Rev Bikes. Uh, I started Rev Bikes about seven years ago and I'm really passionate about transforming existing bikes to electric. Um, I see that biking is a fantastic way to get around, but a lot of people are limited in what they can actually do on a bike, whereas once it's electric, you're really barely limited at all. You're only limited by imagination. This customer um, came to us last week um, and said, I've got several bikes, um, I'm not sure which one to get electric. I said, well, how about the one you're not riding much, maybe because it's a bit heavy or, you know, that um, you wouldn't want to take for a normal bike ride. So he brought this one over to us, it's a full suspension bike, so he didn't really feel confident that it could be made to be electric, but we see no problem with it. Um, he's asked us to put a 500 watt hub motor the rear, so that's what I'll be demonstrating today. I've already done the handlebars, because you might think that that's the easiest part of the job, but it's often actually the most fiddly. So we've got an LCD computer here, um, which gives you your speedo, your battery gauge, things like that, which has a, some buttons on the side to allow you to easily toggle between the settings. It's also got a throttle here, which we often fit on the left hand side there like that, because the throttles tend to interfere somewhat with the gear shifters. What we find is once you've got a motor, you're not shifting front gear very often. So most people will just leave the chain on the largest chain ring, especially with a 500 watt motor. So you're more looking for the higher speeds. Um, you don't need so much assistance on the hills to change down the gears. And also another advantage to putting a throttle on the left is that when you're going around a roundabout or turning right with your arm out, you can throttle and get around the corner safely and not risking hitting your pedal on the corner as you're leaning in and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that this bike is going to have is the pedal X sensor. So we can add that as an aftermarket accessory. It comes as part of the kit. So everything we've got here just unpacks from a box and you can do it at home. This is being a rear wheel motor. You've got your gear cassette obviously, so you need to take that off. I've already prepared this wheel just to save some time so we can get through it. There's two things during a bike conversion that you really need a couple of specialist tools for. One is removing the cassette. So you get a little cassette removal tool like so, which you take the spline out, you put that in there, you then use a chain whip to hold the cassette tight from spinning. And then you grab a spanner and turn the locking ring so I think I even left that one undone and then that just comes, comes off. Okay, so then you put that onto the motorised wheel and away you go. This wheel's pretty much ready to go on now. One thing to watch out for is that the cable is coming out the end of the axle so you do want to be careful not to cause any damage to that because that is a real pain to fix. What we find is that some bikes you need to add a washer. In some cases, like this bike's so back end is a little bit offset to the left. So um, sometimes you need to add an extra washer on one side to make sure it's nice and centered. Um, and the other thing, just before I drop it in, you can probably see the cable kind of can come out. There's a cutaway from the axle on one side. I want that to come up towards my bag that I've got for the controller. So that's already mounted here with the cables run in place already. So I'm going to drop that into, into the wheel so that it's not going to bend out the wrong way. I've got some tabbed washers on here. So these tabbed washers, they've got a little groove on that sits in the dropout and prevents, essentially what this motor is trying to do is to turn the axle. Because the axle is a 12 mil axle with shaved sides on it, so it's cut down to be 10 mil flat sides, so it slides into dropouts and gets locked into place there. If the axle can spin, then your wheel won't turn, you'll just get the axle spinning. Another thing to be aware of is the disc brake. Um, when you're getting the wheel in, you want to make sure the disc brake is not actually going to get damaged in the caliper. I've loosened that off. Sometimes I even take that whole thing off and reattach it once the wheel's in, but I know it's okay with this bike. So um, we can just pop the wheel in and grab the, grab the chain and pop it around the cassette. Pull the derailleur out the way a bit. That's the wheel in. 
So I just want to make sure it's really well centred over the, over the uh, down tube of the bike. If it's off centre, you can tend to find, especially on a downhill, you get a bit of a wobble on the bikes. It's not really ideal. So the advantage of having the motor in the rear wheel, and we do all our larger motors in the rear wheel because the bike's much stronger at the back end. So you've got two stays. Um, you shouldn't ever have any issues with, um, with the dropouts because these bike dropouts are not designed to take twisting force. They're designed to take up and down force but twisting force is different altogether. And we have seen when people have put higher powered motors in front forks that the axle can eventually start to spin and turn and cause significant damage. It's also a benefit to, um, to have the motor under your weight. So a lot of people will um, will request the motor in the in the back, um, just so that it's driving from behind rather than sort of trying to pull you up a hill. Obviously, it's not going to be quick release anymore. So we tend to put a thornproof tube in for our customers when we do a conversion because we want to minimise the chance of them getting a puncture because it's a little bit more fiddly to, to fix. So the controller is the brains of the system. So this is, uh, this is the motor controller. Battery power goes into here. Um, this then interprets all the data from your handlebar controls and sends the power to the motor. So um, important to get a decent quality one of these. Um, this one is good, it's got the waterproof connectors. It's nice and simple, there's no way you can plug anything in wrong. And it's also got an outlet for lights. So you can run in this case 48 volt lights straight into this controller and you'll be running lights on your bike from your main battery so you'll never have to think about whether your lights are usable or not. The next thing I'm going to do is to put the pedal X sensor on. In this case the bottom bracket is a threaded type so what we need to do because we've got two parts to fit this is the sensor so this needs to go on first and it remains in the solid position the second part is the magnetic disc. When the magnets move, it sends the signal to the pedelec and the motor engages automatically. So, in order to secure this with the threaded bottom bracket, there's a that doesn't come standard in the kits, but these are lock rings. Some bikes already have these. Some bikes with external bottom brackets, external bearing bottom brackets are a real pain to attach these sensors to. This bike's fairly straightforward. The next thing, I'm going to do is mount the battery. So this bike's having one of our new batteries, which with the technology improving, even though it's physically smaller than the last batch we had, it's in capacity larger. So the old 48 volt frame batteries that we used to do for this kit, and we used to only have one type available, was a 48 volt 11.6 amp power pack. And it was at least one cell row higher, taller than this one, which would not fit in this bike. Um, this pack is 48 volt, 12.8 amp hour, and it's smaller. So that's the way the technology is evolving. It's not so much that it's getting cheaper, but for a pack, you get more punch, I guess. You get more range. So um, in all cases, actually, you get a bracket that melts to the bike, and then the battery goes, clicks in and out quite easily um, with a key, which is in here, and you can lock it into position. You don't need the key to operate the bike, so you're not going to risk sort of banging your knee on it or something like that, but it locks it into position, and then you can take the keys and be confident that if you leave the bike, someone can't take your battery. There's a, a range of different batteries. If you're running a 36 volt, uh, like a road legal 250 watt setup, um, it'll virtually always be a 36 volt battery pack. Um, with the higher power motors, they run at a higher voltage because it gives more torque and more top speed. So, I'm just gonna slide that up a little bit higher. I'm conscious of the position of the battery because I've gotta make sure that this has room to move forward when the suspension is compressed, but also I've gotta make sure that I can still get it in and slide it into position. 
So it needs to be able to come in and out easy. So I'm fairly tight for space in this frame. But I think that's about it. So I'll put it up as high as I can while still being able to get it in and out. Yeah, this pack is um, built with, I think they're Samsung. They're lithium trimetal, so nickel, manganese, cobalt. Um, they're generally the main cells being used in most electric cars now. The thing why you don't get as much um, life from electric bike batteries as you do from electric car batteries, like you might get um, you might get 10 years from electric car batteries, but you'd be lucky to get five from an electric bike battery, especially with the same level of use. Main part of the reason is that because it's such a small pack, the systems on board electric bikes are designed to try and squeeze as much energy density as they can into the pack so that you've got as long a range as possible from a smaller pack. So whereas the um, electric cars charge each individual cell inside there to maybe 4.0 volts or 4.1 volts, electric bike batteries in the, across the whole industry charge to 4.2 volts per cell. So that means that although you get more range per charge, it actually means that the lifespan of your battery pack is about halved. So we've done some R&D on this and we've read widely about the effects and we've had produced for us special battery management boards that balance at that lower voltage and stop charging at 4.1 volts per cell. So what we anticipate, we're, we're still going through um, our first round of packs that we've released with this technology, but we expect that they'll have at least double the lifespan of the existing packs. So that's exciting. That's exciting for the industry, I think. Um, the cost of a replacement battery is that The cost is about half the cost of the kit. So the batteries range, our batteries range from 500 through to 900 dollars. This one being about 800. Um, so yeah, it's a significant cost. You don't want it to run out sooner than than you hope for. Um, so, yeah, the batteries is the thing. It keep, they keep evolving, um, which is awesome. So, yeah, it's one of those things that, unfortunately, the industry just responds to requests. Like our supplier, when we said, well, why are these cells charging to such high voltage, you know? Why can't we get the same sort of life as we do from electric cars? And she's an engineer, the, my contact um, with the suppliers. And she said, well, that's a great idea, you know. The main reason you can't just get a 41 volt charger instead of a 42 volt charger is because the balancing of the BMS board won't match. And the, if your cells don't balance, because that happens right at the end of the charge cycle, if your cells don't balance, then they'll get out of balance. You'll start dropping in range dramatically and the cells, the pack will soon um, be uh, exhausted. So yeah, she uh, responded to our request to make up some BMSs like this and had 3,000 made on the spot. So we didn't order 3,000. Um, we didn't even order 100. But we, um, so she's obviously, a lot of our other customers abroad in, in Europe and in Russia are obviously going to be using our technology too, which is exciting. So I think I've got everything plugged in. The ultimate test is to turn the display on on the handlebars, woohoo! And we'll see if we've got power. All right, so it's easy as that. <laughs> Thank you.